Hi, could I ask my uh, lovely workshop presenters to come to the stage, please? Okay. Um, right, now at this next session, we're going to hear um, five-minute summaries from each of the workshops that will bring a flavour of what actually occurred on, in the workshops that you weren't in, and hopefully where you can agree if you were uh, in the workshop. So first up, I've got Ros Pine um, from Workshop A talking about how we got on with OA Books. Hi, everyone. So we had a really lively uh, set of workshops for OA Books. Um, thank you so much to everyone who participated. Um, so prior to the workshops, we'd identified four areas that we thought might be interesting to look at in the context of how can we grow OA Books. Um, they were funding and models, disciplines and formats, cultural issues and licenses and rights. Um, when the group came together, it became clear that sort of people felt that licenses and rights were sort of interesting but perhaps less critical when thinking about how we could grow OA Books. So we just focused on the other three. So in terms of cultural issues, um, so I should say for each workshop, we started out by setting out the landscape. We then moved on in the second workshop to thinking about the challenges. And then in the third workshop, we came up with some tangible ideas for you know, how could we address those challenges. So what you're seeing on the slide here is very much the output from the third workshop. In terms of cultural issues, there was a sense that books are often seen as a sort of afterthought in a, in a sort of funding context. Um, they are not valued as highly as books. Um, and it was interesting, in fact, in general, that sometimes we felt that OA books were acting as a bit of a magnifying glass for issues that actually related to books more generally. Um, so we felt it would be very helpful if funders could make open access books more of a priority. But um, even within what we already have, can funders be better at communicating policy and funding availability and talking about the value that they perceive in books? From publishers, there was a request for more transparency and more communication over costs and fees, and thinking about how publishers could remove barriers to publishing away. And in some cases, this was just about, again, better communication, getting better at leading authors through the process and making them aware of what the options were. Um, in terms of institutions, there was a suggestion that institutions might try to safeguard some of their OA funding specifically to support books, and that institutions have a really important role in helping to raise awareness. You will notice that there is a common theme here which is very much about communication. We need to be talking more to each other as a community about open access books, and we also really need to be ensuring that authors are better informed so they can make informed choices. Um, on funding and models, I mean, I think the first thing anyone wrote was there's no money. Um, <laughs> um, so perhaps our wish would be for more of it. But again, we felt that funders might engage more with different models and, different, and funding different aspects of OA books. And we also talked about the fact that now some funders are thinking about or have developed their own OA platforms, but those OA platforms are very focused on journal articles and other short form communications. Can we have something that's more suitable for long form? Um, there was also much discussion about the need for diverse solutions at this point. Uh, we'll come on to disciplinary issues, but essentially books Publishing is a very diverse landscape, so at various points we talked about preprints, perhaps in a mathematical or physics context, freemium, crowdfunding or mission-led, perhaps for things in a sort of grand challenges area, and there was also some discussion about disaggregating publishing services. Could you pay just for peer review? Could you pay just for other services that publishers might provide? So a need for more pilots and more exploration of options. Um, on institutions, again, in terms of that sort of diversifying options, more, more continued support for university-led presses, and thinking about pooled resource initiatives um, to share expertise. Um, in terms of disciplines, formats, and rights, this is a really broad category which could bring in both you know, disciplinary differences in terms of the challenges for, say, art and architecture and um, Subjects which have a lot of third-party rights might have particular challenges. Um, formats might mean both you know, different types of editions and types of book, but it might also mean HTML or PDF. Um, and then rights could be talking about CC licensing the rights out, but it could also have to do with the sort of fundamental issues of who owns the copyright to which bits of a format and how do you unpick that when you're trying to share it. 
Where we coalesced um, in, our, in our sort of discussions was about the need for common standards for identifiers, and this is something that's been discussed earlier on um, in the conference. So can we have common metadata standards? Can we have common standards for you know, using DOIs, for example, reducing our reliance on ISBNs um, so that we're not sort of isolating books from mid formats and other types, pooling or aggregating DOI registries? Um, clarifying ownership of copyright, and then there were some questions about the suitability of Creative Commons licenses. Could there be something that's more appropriate? But in general, it was felt that we needed community-led solutions to some of these sort of formats and rights issues in particular. So in terms of next steps, um, certainly trying to share the notes from this um, workshop, perhaps on the Casoli Kitchen, in listservs, using our own networks to do that. Part of what we think we need to do is raise the profile of OA books, spark interest, spark more ideas. We also discuss the possibility for potential follow-up workshops, but we'll also say this is a really broad topic, so it probably will need different actors to take on different actions. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you very much, Roz. That sounds very interesting. Um, next up, we have workshop B, which is automating workflows, and Gerben's going to take us through what uh, occurred in that workshop. Thank you, Laura. Hi, my name is uh, Gerben. Um, I ran the workshop uh, together with Mario Malicki. We're both at the University of Amsterdam. Um, the background really was um, the replicability crisis and the, uh, the Lancet series on avoidable research waste and the fact that the main Dutch healthcare funder uh, was very concerned about uh, the degree of research waste, 85% is the claim, and the replica replicability crisis. And my personal worry for many years has been the widespread publication bias, which is, of course, um, um, a part of, all, of the whole problem in, in current science landscape. Um, I would like to start with a, a quote from uh, the most recent uh, EU expert um, group um, on the role of funders, the crucial role of funders. In a landscape of unlimited quest for rankings, funders can affect all functions, all functions of scholarly communication and have considerable power, unquote. So the nice thing about funders and their crucial role is that funders really act really upstream and um, are at the start of new research projects and, and therefore they can have a, a big a preventive impact on, on their um, the bad things like the research waste uh, with which I started. Um, so the main Dutch healthcare funder became interested in um, the question, can we automate our workflow? And this with a, a particular eye to, to, to reducing waste and their role in it. So uh, what, what Mario Malicki did, he, he really teased out all the different steps in their, in their workflow, I think it came to 57 different steps, but we reduced it for these workshops into eight, eight large main steps in the workflow. And to give you an example, the first one is, is the identification of research gaps, knowledge gaps, and that of course for a funder is crucial in call development. And then it goes all the way through to um, the, pro the process of reviewing the uh, pr research proposals and then all the way down to the portfolio analysis that becomes increasingly um, important for funders. So the delegates in our groups were invited to take a funder's perspective and felt also free to take uh, slightly different perspectives, maybe that of a researcher, and then reflect on the positive and negative sides of um, 23 different um, automation tools that were found in the scoping research by, by Mario Malicki. Uh, the three sessions all uh, started with a short presentation of the findings of the scoping review, and then we, en we went on with small group uh, discussions and, and a, a plenary wrap-up of those. Um, to give you a few examples, in the development phase, the development of a call, um, Increasingly, there is an interest in the automation of uh, systematic reviews, um, which is an important um, component in reducing research waste, because uh, the hope is that it will um, reduce uh, the avoidable uh, or unnecessary duplication. 
There, there is um, a development in uh, what they call knowledge weaving, which is also uh, quite an interesting development where you automatically, using the, the literature and the big data out there, uh, you can see which fields are growing at which rate, where the publications come from, where the experts actually live, and um, on which, if we talk about biology and medicine, which species certain uh, hypotheses have been tested, and actually what, what the outcomes are. In the middle stages of the workflow, we have um, tasks like selecting reviewers, but also um, checking the proposals. So there's a software called Stat Reviewer that can automatically check whether um, uh, proposals have all the necessary elements that are uh, supposed to be in a proposal or in a research protocol. Then in the final stage where we have to, as a funder, measure output, um, we discussed a smart combination of a wide variety of metrics um, and then at different levels of aggregation of those metrics um, to um, measure output from the viewpoint of an academic or a, or a trainer or a reviewer. And the final session, the third session, was we ended with a, a vision of the far, far away future um, where we would, uh, where we have discussed like a booking system for researchers because if the automation tools can uh, um, identify the research gaps, the knowledge gaps, um, you, would, you could potentially create a market um, with ideas worth pursuing and then looking for, for parties or institutes or researchers that would be interested to solve these problems. And uh, the hope was that um, that, we, that would be conducive to a, a reduction of global uh, redundancy and um, getting the right level of reproducibility. So um, a bit of reproduci reproducibility, of course, is right, but um, unnecessary replication uh, we would like to avoid. Um, so there's um, artificial intelligence for gap detection, um, but one of the, uh, the fears in the group was that it might be stifling, stifling uh, creativity um, and uh, serendip serendip serendipity, um, because there were doubts whether the, um, the, the artificial intelligence would be, would be able to, uh, if everything is packaged in, in algorithms, um, people were not really convinced that they could outdo human beings in, in becoming really creative. So I will um, define the pros and the cons uh, uh, that, that were encountered in our groups, um, giving you three examples of pros, three examples of cons, and three examples of what are not really pros or cons, but more reflections. Starting with the pros. People in the group thought that um, it would probably be positive if the automation processes or software could help us in identifying emerging fields. It would be useful for funders um, and point out to um, uh, new directions. The second pro was to improve the quality of papers early on, and that would help uh, reducing the, the reproducibility crisis. People also felt that um, using a wide variety of metrics for assessment of researchers and output um, assessment for funders uh, might be used to tailor uh, the choice of relevant metrics for particular um, aims. For example, um, if an employer would, would be interested to hire a researcher versus a, a, a teacher, the different metrics could be weighed differently or selected differently. Going through the three examples of, of cons, uh, of automation process and maybe artificial intelligence, which are not synonymous, is that people didn't have like limited, limitless trust in these uh, uh, algorithms because the basic data, and here's the link with publication bias, if the raw data are flawed, uh, there is no guarantee yet that, that the algorithms will, will get it right. The second thing was that there was a fear that as the levels of abs abstraction um, increase, um, the results might, might be more difficult to understand and the biases might be more difficult to uh, detect. And the final con um, that I will mention now, there were of course more, is that um, even the smart combination of output metrics do not really preclude their, their misuse. 
um, because they might have been designed for certain domains, but if you start using them for completely other purposes, that, that might, might end up in misuse. And of course, there's an analogy to the journal impact factor, maybe. So ending with three reflections, um, people in the groups thought that um, it would be nice to have these automation tools ups as upstream as, uh, as possible because um, you actually you don't want an atmosphere of policing and, and blaming, but it, it is much nicer to, to have all these tools upstream so that the researchers can prevent a lot of these uh, damaging um, uh, phenomena early on. A second one is that the um, um, that we should be aware that the introduction of these kind of tools also have a, a social component in organizations using them and there should be a sufficient um, um, awareness of the ramifications of introducing these uh, technologies. And then finally, um, we thought it was a, that what, what the scoping review f found is that there are uh, proof of principle studies, proof of concept studies, but in the near future, we probably need more real-world comparisons between different uh, automation tools or um, artificial intelligence uh, technologies, maybe comparing against humans or comparing uh, with um, competing products. Um, but then the problem would arise that if there's discrepancies, which technology or which approach is the gold standard? It's not, it's not completely apparent. So that's something to, uh, to think about, the, the problem of the gold standard. So let me end with thank, uh, thanking uh, uh, Laura for uh, taking notes, uh, without which I couldn't uh, have uh, done this uh, summary, and Mario Malitsky for uh, presenting most of the content of our workshops. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. Um, next up is Rob Johnson to talk about leveling the, play leveling the playing field. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Laura, and uh, I'm, yes, reporting on the session very ably facilitated by Andrea, so thank you, Andrea, for doing such a, a good job for us. So, in uh, three short slides, what do we try to look at? Uh, the barriers and obstacles to a level playing field, and we looked at, we started looking by, at four aspects of research, and it was pointed out perhaps it should be five, so we, we added in the evaluation of research across the the other activities listed there. And I think we, we looked at that in groups, but we found a lot of commonality in terms of the, the challenges. So some of that being about unstable political and economic environments, often just a deficit in terms of infrastructure and um, perhaps, you know, we often overlook the cultural capital that's needed for research to happen effectively. But the risk of a sort of neo-colonialist approach in trying to address some of that by foisting Western methods and solutions onto, onto the rest of the world, so the need to be mindful of that. And we discussed the fact that often a lot of this is about mindsets and it's about understanding and awareness and that's, that's where perhaps we need, to, we need to intervene. So we then looked at who's involved in this, who are the stakeholders, identified a large number of stakeholders. We tend to focus on those at the, at the top, so infrastructure and service providers. So we mentioned that deficit of infrastructure and recognizing that the Global South needs that infrastructure, those tools to be available to them. The role of publishers, funders, learned, learned societies. And I think the key thing there is that we're talking about a lot of multi-way relationships and often, as with many of these issues, it's a collective action problem. So it needs a lot of people to come together to address some of the imbalances in the, in the current system. So I'm sure, as with many of the other workshops, we covered an awful lot of ground. Just to pull out a few, a few things, I think generally we discussed the need to, to just raise awareness, so just to think about what are the implications of, act, of activities in the West, in the Global North, uh, but other parts of the world. And I think hearing from Haseeb and Anuma yesterday was very helpful and many people said continuing to have that kind of dialogue where we just hear those different perspectives and it maybe makes us just think again about some of the things that we, that we do. Working to, to change mindsets but recognizing there is no one size fits all solution. So even within countries there can be hu huge disparities um, and very different needs. And the need to look at sustainable capacity building. So this isn't necessarily just about projects and one-off interventions. It's a long-term process of, of building capacity. 
perhaps getting closer to home in terms of what can happen within the, the publishing community. Research for Life, more publishers joining Research for Life, so more content being made available through it. But as I said, recognizing the importance of tools and databases. So access is not just about access to content, it's about the ability to discover that content. It's about how content gets into those discovery systems in the first place. So thinking more broadly about what tools and resources are needed. Um, clarity on APC waivers for, for publishers, so making it as, as clear and simple as possible for researchers to know do they qualify for a waiver, what do they have to do to, to access that. Um, the possibility of some pilot programs, often partnering with societies who have um, a really important role potentially in reaching out to research communities uh, internationally. And lastly, just the need to think carefully about diversity and to think about can editorial boards, can reviewer communities start to reflect more closely the makeup of the, the author community. So we hope to put together a blog post and just summarize some of those findings. It should go on the, I think, the Research for Life blog. So Andrea and I, Andrea and I will be working hard on that over the next few days. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. That was great. And um, Danny Kingsley is now going to come and talk about uh, the early career scholarship. And I think Becca is going to hold some things up. Okay, so hello. I was one of the participants, not one, not one of the organisers of the workshop. Okay. Um, and uh, I was collared into doing the presentation. So what we're going to do is actually talk about the the process that we went through. So we had four groups, and we started with something called an empathy map. And there's a picture of one here, and I have a, um, a wonderful assistant to assist me. And I might have to do the other side. You can see the problem here about not understanding the difference between A0 and A1, but actually it turned out that having the larger size tablecloth uh, uh, working paper was excellent for us to work from. And what we did was we used pap um, some papers that have been sort of summarised the conversations that that group have had with early career researchers about their experiences with writing. And so this empathy map was us um, having to put our understanding, our interpretation of those, of those uh, interviews onto a piece of paper in order about who are we empathising with, what do they need to do, what do they see, what do they say, and so on. And in the process, we were interpreting f what we were seeing rather than pushing our own biases onto it. After that, we were asked to, after we'd put the early career researchers into their own words, think about the pains and gains for those early career researchers, and then identify some of the problems. With those problems, they became multiple problems. We could see plenty of issues, things like not having enough time, having other things, um, other concerns about uh, imposter syndrome, uh, not, uh, not knowing how to approach the, the publishing process, not knowing where to publish, those sorts of things. And so that, once we identified a problem, we then said, what is our... Um, our how might we statement. And so, for example, my group said, how might we help early career researchers disseminate their research beyond the publication? How could we help them with that process, with the writing process? And then we had to generate some solutions. So we came up with different ideas about how we might approach that particular problem that each individual group had identified. And then we chose one, and we picked the best one, for example, that, right there is actually our one, as it turned out. Um, where we sort of said, okay, here's a solution. And the solutions were very wide ranging from an app to a research project to a training session to an online database and so on. So lots of different solutions. And so at the end, each group presented their results. So I'm not going to talk about the results here because really what the thing that was valuable was actually the process for us. Um, so we were told that um, this, this empathy map is actually publicly available. It's a fantastic process to go through if you are thinking about trying to address a problem. One, the last thing I want to talk about just about the event was what people said about this process of doing this, about approaching a problem. We liked, liked the focus on the user, liked something to have tangible to work on, like the tablecloth size maps. Uh, we stopped getting stuck in, wild, in our silos of work and discipline. We didn't come in with our own preconceived ideas. We had to think in terms of the, of the user, of the early career researcher. Um, it was very collaborative and we had to come up with more ideas than we would by ourselves. The very fast pace of it, the three separate workshops where we go, oh, we've only got 10 minutes, hurry, 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 meant that we were really productive really quickly. Um, having those breaks also helped. We think we were much better off having three separate workshop sessions rather than doing it in two and a half hours flat. We probably would 
would have died from exhaustion if we tried to do it that way. Um, we realised there's obviously a need for cross-sector working, as we always say in these sorts of events. Um, we did get straight down to the task and uh, we felt that this process meant that people really had no fear, could share without fear of being told that their, their ideas weren't good or were of no value. Everyone had an ability to, to contribute. So it was very enjoyable and thank you to the facilitators. Citation by identifier. Hey, so we were the final workshop working on citation by identifier. This was our vision coming in uh, that the only manual bibliographic steps in the publication workflow from authoring to production uh, should be when an author chooses which work to cite. Uh, so the idea is that authors cite persistent identifiers and the metadata retrieval and the biblio bibliographic formatting can all be automated from there. Uh, so we started with an introduction and we made a collaborative Google document so people could uh, take notes together and uh, write down their findings. So we went over a little bit, what is a persistent identifier? It's a long lasting standardized reference to a citable work. Uh, then which was pretty fun was an activity where uh, each individual got three persistent identifiers and had to locate that article um, and report the title on a piece of paper. The title is used so we could see whether they got the right article and they also had to report the time it took them um, to, to locate the work so we know whether they got it right and how long it took. So one issue is I can't move the slide down. Can you press the down arrow? Great, and, and actually even press it again. <laughs> uh, so what the visualization here shows is the seconds it took by the different ID types. Uh, each dot is a single lookup of a persistent identifier. The green ones, the individual was able to locate the correct article. The blue ones, they were uh, unable to locate the correct article. So what you see is when we did text sites, which are the traditional, um, you know, author names, journal, and year, that had the lowest retrieval accuracy, which makes sense because it's not actually persistent. Um, URLs also were problematic sometimes because uh, they sometimes are really long or laborious to type into your computer. Uh, the more, I guess, well-formed <coughs> persistent identifiers did have a higher accuracy rate and oftentimes were faster, such as PubMed Central IDs, DOIs, short DOIs, and PubMed IDs. But even with these, there were some mistakes. And uh, one issue is that persistent IDs we found are not very human readable, they're machine readable. So uh, sometimes you could mistype a number and then go to the wrong article, for example. Or you could Google it and uh, Google would not give you the article because it doesn't necessarily understand um, that it's a persistent ID. So uh, two suggestions later in the workshop that we got to related to this were that whenever you're entering a persistent ID into a system, it would be nice if it gave you a live preview uh, of where it resolves to such that you know you're identifying the right thing. And the second is, for search engines, it would be nice if when you put in a persistent ID like a short DOI, they actually detect that it's a short DOI format and have the top result be the, uh, the resolved page. Uh, so that would help because oftentimes people Google these persistent IDs and don't know the right place to look them up. I, you can cycle through this all. Uh, so, so the goals of citation by identifier are to have unambiguous references, lossless publishing, and easy retrieval of um, cited works. In the interest of time, let's skip through the slide. So uh, the second workshop we did was discussing the barriers in the way of uh, citation by identifier. The first large one was that there are vague or confusing, confusing instructions to authors. 
uh, between different journals. There's also a big lack of awareness of the whole persistent identifier issue, uh, which we found was probably the most prevalent issue. A less prevalent issue was that maybe authors are just not really interested because they don't see how it benefits them. Also, there's inconsistency of requirements across journals and publishers. Some require you to put a DOI, some forbid you to put a DOI in the citation. Um, also, historical works may not have persistent identifiers. So there's this problem of existing works, and for there you may need other systems like Wikidata that can um, work retroactively. So the final workshop we discussed solutions. And uh, we had probably about 50 solutions that, that people threw out there. I've kind of uh, chosen a few that I think there'll be people in the audience who can take these solutions in a very actionable way and apply them um, as soon as next Thursday. Uh, but anyways, for journals, uh, journals don't necessarily need to care what reference style an article is submitted with as long as the references can, uh, can include persistent IDs they can generate all the metadata from those persistent IDs and that could take a lot of the work off the author's back and ensure that the proper workflows are being followed. The next recommendation is for PhD programs that um, DOI should be minted for PhD theses and students should include ORCID. Perhaps in graduate school, the, you know, one of the first classes you should have when you get there is to make an ORCID for yourself <laughs> so you have it going forward. Uh, for search engines, they should detect and resolve persistent IDs, such as short DOIs. For metadata repositories, office, um, things like Crossref or even PubMed can have incorrect meta metadata that's been deposited by publishers. So there should be an e easy, centralized way to uh, report incorrect metadata and get it uh, fixed. Right now, a lot of people have to resort to, say, tweeting their journal, and it's a very difficult and uncertain process of whether you can actually get metadata for, say, even your own article fixed if it's incorrect. And then for organizations producing style guidelines of, like, uh, citations, they should um, encourage or even mandate persistent identifiers in the citations. As in the modern age, a persistent identifier in the citation and a link, or even just a link via the persistent identifier, is all that really matters. Finally, librarians can educate patrons regarding persistent identifiers and how they can be convenient in the long term. Say if you have to submit your article to another journal and you need um, to get back to the source. And that's the end of the presentation. So, um, yeah, thanks. I should say the, uh, these slides are online and our Google Doc is online and I'll tweet both those links. Great, thank you, Daniel. I'd like um, to thank all of our speakers and uh, again to ask you to thank all of our, our speakers and our facilitators and you as participants in the workshops. Okay, round of applause. Okay, we're now gonna head to a break um, and I am reminding everybody that the yellow forms, the survey about the, uh, the conference, uh, please fill those in. They're incredibly helpful for us in determining how we're gonna structure next year's conference. Thanks very much.